The Hutterites are a 500-year-old Christian community that have truly withstood the pressures of time. Today, there are an estimated 50,000 Hutterites spread out across Canada and America who peacefully practice their faith in the exact same manner as their ancestors practiced it during the radical Swiss Reformation, which began in 1525. But unfortunately, the history of the Hutterites is anything but peaceful. Although a pacifist Christian group, the Hutterites were relentlessly persecuted by the Catholic State Church, the Protestant State Church, and the Ottoman Empire, which I would consider a genocide. The Hutterites went from a population of between 10 to 20,000 in the 1500s all the way down to less than 400 people in 1762. But due to the freedoms and liberties in America, the Hutterites managed to flee their persecutors in Europe and since then have far surpassed any of their previous historical population numbers. The story of the Hutterites is a story about true faith, high vitality, and great persecution. But before we can learn more about the Hutterites, we first need to understand the movement that they originated from. This movement was the Radical Swiss Reformation, which I talked about in depth in my Spread of the Anabaptist video, which you can find at the top of the screen, but I will briefly cover the Radical Reformation right here. The Catholic State Church dominated Western Europe for centuries. However, by the 1500s, disease, death, wars and poverty, along with the rapid spread of ideas made possible by the printing press, had prepared Europe for sweeping change. As many Europeans became literate, they could begin reading the Bible for themselves, instead of relying on the interpretations of the Bible through their Catholic priests. And as more did this, they began to see inconsistencies in what the priests would preach and with what they actually read in the Bible. In 1517, Martin Luther famously nailed his 95 theses to the door of Germany's Wittenberg Castle Church, beginning the reforming process and ultimately creating Protestantism. In these 95 theses, Luther questioned many Catholic practices that he did not see in the Bible, such as the selling of indulgences, among many other practices. However, many Christians at this time believed that Martin Luther had not gone far enough in his reforms, and these Christian reformers became known as the radical Protestant reformers, although they'll be named the Anabaptists by their persecutors very soon. An old Hutterite saying about this time goes, Luther has indeed broken down the old house, but he has not built up a new one. And these radical Protestant reformers began trying to build this new church that would have doctrines and practices rooted in the gospel, not practices created by any man. In 1522, Ulrich Zwingli, a young priest at the Grossmuster Church in Zurich, Switzerland, began to preach about reforming infant baptism and other religious practices. Zwingli strongly disliked infant baptism and believed that babies should not be baptized but instead come to make that decision on their own in adulthood, which we call a believer's baptism. Zwingli gathered a group of like-minded reformers to be his associates, who would study and preach alongside him. Among these associates were George Blaurock, Conrad Grebel, Felix Mounds, and a dozen others. However, many of these associates began to believe that Zwingli was not moving fast enough in his reforms. The city council of Zurich kept delaying and denying Zwingli's proposals to reform certain practices such as mandatory infant baptisms. And Zwingli simply accepted this bureaucracy with an unwillingness to break any rules. At a debate in Zurich in October 1523, one of the radical associates asked Zwingli what should be done about the mass. Zwingli responded by saying, the council will make that decision. Another radical reformer, Simon Stumpf, interrupted Zwingli, stating, the decision has already been made by the Spirit of God, and that the Bible was the final word, not any government authority. Zwingli's unwillingness created a division between him and his associates, and his associates began meeting on their own. By 1525, the debate in Zurich between the council and the radical reformers was becoming toxic. The final city council meeting on January 17, 1525, ruled that all those continuing to refuse to baptize their infants will be expelled from Zurich if the infants are not baptized within a week. 
Now, Conrad Grable, one of these radical reformers, had recently had a daughter born on January 5th, named Rachel, and had refused to baptize her, so this ruling was extremely personal to him. So a few days later, on January 21st, 1525, 16 of the radical reformers met in secret, a block away from the Grossmuster church, in Felix Mann's mother's home, that pink house. That evening, after prayer, George Blaurock baptized Conrad Grable. In turn, George Blaurock was also baptized, who then baptized everyone else at the meeting. These baptisms marked the first rebaptisms of those who had been baptized as infants, and this evening gave birth to the Radical Reformation, Anabaptism. This event is so critical because it's the moment that the Reformation that had begun with Martin Luther in 1517 had now officially divided, and it will remain divided, developing along two different groups of reformers. You have the first group, the original mainline moderate Protestants, the Lutherans, Calvinists, Swinglians, and Anglicans, who are a part of the magisterial Protestant Reformation. They believe in a believer's church, but they also believe that the state and the church should not be separated, but remain intertwined, and that the church should continue to be led by high-ranking government officials, called magistrates. Then you have the second group, the radical reformers, called the Anabaptists by the persecutors, who are an offshoot of the Magisterial Protestant Reformation. It includes Andreas Karlstad, the radical who Luther condemned and had kicked out. It includes Felix Mons, Conrad Grable, George Blaurock, among others, who abandoned Zwigli for his bureaucracy and moderation. The second group also believes in a believer's church, but are against infant baptism. But the biggest difference between the Anabaptists and the Magisterial Protestants and the Catholic world is the Anabaptist belief that the church and the state should be separated and independent of one another. At the time, these ideas were extremely fringe and radical, and the Anabaptist Swiss Brethren will suffer heavily for these convictions. In the following weeks, the radical reformers worked hard to spread their movement. Anabaptism spread rapidly in Zurich, and soon, adults in the surrounding villages were also being rebaptized. In late 1525, an early Anabaptist leader from Bavaria named Balthasar Hubmeier shocked his entire congregation by proclaiming that he now rejected infant baptism, and on Easter Sunday, he and his entire adult congregation rejected their infant baptisms and were all rebaptized as adults. Anabaptism was spreading so rapidly that on the 7th of March 1526, the town hall of Zurich passed an edict that made adult rebaptism punishable by drowning. This law instantly made the practices of Anabaptism punishable by death in the very town that Anabaptism had been founded just one year before. The first victim of this law was Felix Mons, who was tied up with rope and thrown into the icy waters of the Lamont River. Felix Mons was one of the original founders of the Swiss Anabaptist Brethren and became the first martyr of Anabaptism. It was in this murderous political climate that the Anabaptists began to spread eastward to Tyrol and Moravia. We will begin our story in Moravia. In early 1526, Balthasar Hubmeier escaped from the prison in Zurich, where he was being tortured, and fled to Nicholsburg, Moravia, where he had received an invitation from Nicholsburg's powerful noble named Lord Leonhard of Liechtenstein. In July, Hubmeier arrived in Nicholsburg, today called Milikov, which was in the independent kingdom of Moravia, now placing Hubmeier outside of King Ferdinand I's jurisdiction. Ferdinand was the Archduke of the Austrian hereditary lands, and also a staunch Catholic, who had it out for Hubmeier since his Anabaptist teachings in Waldshut. But now, out of Ferdinand's domain, Hubmeier could write, preach, and convert safely, under the protection of Lord Leonhard in Nicholsburg. In the previous century, Moravia and Bohemia had been the center of the Proto-Protestant Hussite Revolution, also called the Bohemian Revolution and the Czech Revolution. By the 1520s, the unity of the Brethren, who embodied the anti-clergy, communitarian impulse of the Hussites, was well established, even among the ruling classes. 
The violent Hussite wars had ended with the Hussites and the Catholics compromising with each other, resulting now in a very tolerant land where Catholics, Lutherans, and the Hussites lived peacefully. Now too, the prominent Anabaptist Balthazar Hubmeier could also live peacefully and spread his Anabaptist beliefs. Upon Hubmeier's arrival in Nicholsburg in July 1526, he converted Lord Leonhard and the assistant preacher of the Lutheran congregation, Oswald Glate, to Anabaptism. Hubmeier then set out to convert the entire Lutheran congregation in Nicholsburg to Anabaptism, just as he had done to the Zwiglian congregation in Waldschut. Many Anabaptists from all over Central Europe began fleeing to Nicholsburg, where Hubmeier had established a large Anabaptist congregation, made possible by the protection provided by Lord Leonhard of Liechtenstein, who had opened up his own castle, the Liechtenstein Castle, to house Anabaptists, who had fled to Nicholsburg, many of whom had arrived with absolutely nothing except the clothing on their back, completely impoverished. Lord Leonhard also exempted the Anabaptists from having to pay any war taxes or contribute fighting-aged boys to Ferdinand to defend against the invading Ottoman Empire. Under the influence of Hubmar, Nicholsburg became a bastion of various Anabaptist groups, with Albert Newman in 1609 estimating that by the end of 1526, the Nicholsburg congregation had a membership of 6,000 to 12,000 Anabaptists, and this was all due entirely to Hubmeier's efforts. However, with such diversity came great division, and the Anabaptists in Nicholsburg began to divide into two distinct camps over several issues. The issues included war taxes to Ferdinand I, the use of the sword, the community of goods, and eschatology. The first camp held that the sword should only be used in extreme cases, including the ability to protect their wife and children, as well as life or death self-defense situations. This camp was led by Balthasar Hubmeier himself, along with Leonhard and Spittemeier, and were called the Schwertler, or Swordsmen. This group of men were considered moderates and lived within the walls of the town of Nicholsburg, many within the Liechtenstein Castle. The other group were the extreme pacifists, claiming that the sword should never be permitted under any circumstances, and this group began to separate themselves from the swordsmen, moving themselves outside the town walls of Nicholsburg into a nearby village of Bergen, which was also owned and under the domain of Lord Leonhard. These pacifists were called the Stabler, or Men of the Staff, and were led by Jacob Wiedemann and Philip Jagger. The historian James Steyer has written that the Stablar also called themselves the Gemeinschaffer, meaning community people. At this point, these two groups are already polarized. But in May 1527, Hans Hutt strolls into town, and in the words of historian George Williams, Hutt completes the polarization of these two groups. Hans Hutt had taken part in the German Peasants' Revolt, and was heavily influenced by the anti-materialist piety and religious devotion of Thomas Munzer, but was also influenced by Munster's violent apocalyptic teachings as well. I will create separate videos covering Hans Hutt and Thomas Munster in the future, because they are both extremely controversial, dynamic men. Anyways, Hutt immediately sides with Jacob Weidman's camp in their division with Hubmeier, mainly over eschatology, but also with the Stabler's anti-ruler, anti-magistrate sentiments. Hutt also likely agreed with the Stabler camp's leanings toward wanting a voluntary, apostolic community of goods. There was a debate arranged between Hans Hutt and Balthasar Hubmeier that took place in Bergen, just north of Nicholsburg, which was also owned by the Liechtenstein magistrates. And historically, it was thought that the main issue that they had debated over was the issue of non-resistance, the use of the sword. However, we now know from eyewitness testimony that other topics were debated as well. Most notable were the topics of eschatology and apocalypticism. Hutt, being heavily influenced by Munzer, believed that they were all living in the end times, and that the second coming of Christ and Judgment Day would be coming in 1528, something which Hubmeier apparently had no patience for and completely disagreed with Hutt on. 
Unfortunately, the two sides could not reconcile their differences, and a second disputation was organized, this time in the Nicholsburg Liechtenstein Castle, where Lord Leonhard himself was present. This disputation creates extreme division among the two groups, because after the disputation, Hans Hut is arrested under the order of Lord Leonhard, the magistrate, and is imprisoned in the Liechtenstein Castle. We don't know why Hutt was arrested, but we can do some speculation here. According to eyewitness testimony by Hans Nadler, he stated that seven subjects were debated, baptism, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, God's judgment, God's verdict, the end of the world, the new kingdom, and the coming of Christ. Of course, five of these seven topics deal with eschatology, and we know that Hutt's eschatology was extremely apocalyptic due to the influence of Munster's teachings. Hutt believed that they were living in the end times and that in 1528, Judgment Day would come along with the second coming of Christ. We also know that Hutt's apocalypticism was underpinned by an anti-magistrate, anti-ruler sentiment, with the idea that all worldly rulers are wicked and ungodly, and that state rulers, people like Lord Leonhard of Liechtenstein, should not be baptized into a congregation, nor wield any authority in a congregation. So I presume that when Hutt was arguing his eschatological views with Hubmeier, Hutt's anti-magistrate sentiment was alarming to Lord Leonhard, as it may have sounded seditious. Whom Leonhard himself was baptized by Hubmeier, and whom was also the magistrate of Nicholsburg. So anyways, Hutt ended up being imprisoned by Leonhard Lichtenstein and ended up being imprisoned in the Lichtenstein castle. But of course, as you can imagine, the Stabilar erupted in anger. Hubmeier tries to argue with the leaders of the Stabler that even Jesus Christ himself did not attempt to predict the exact time of his second coming. However, during the night, a friend of Hans Hutt managed to break Hutt out of prison by using a snaring net to lower Hutt from the castle walls, whereby Hans Hutt fled Nicholsburg and made his way to Augsburg, where he will meet his fate. At the same time of all this debate in Nicholsburg, the Ottoman Empire had been planning to invade the Kingdom of Hungary. These plans came to fruition on the 29th of August, 1526, when the Ottoman Empire invaded Hungary, defeating King Louis II in the Battle of Mohawks, where the king was killed on the battlefield. Ferdinand eagerly applied to the Hungarian and Bohemian parliaments to be a candidate in the upcoming king elections in order to replace the former King Louis II and gain control of his vast lands. Later, on the 24th of October, 1526, the Bohemian parliament elected Ferdinand to be the king of Bohemia, giving him jurisdiction over Bohemia, which included the territories of Moravia. However, Ferdinand had to agree to respect the traditional privileges given to the estate nobles, which he agreed to do. Nevertheless, with complete control now over the Moravian territories, Ferdinand ordered for Hubmeier's arrest. And Hubmeier was unfortunately imprisoned at the Krustein Castle in 1527. Hubmeier was then executed at the stake on March 10, 1528, in Vienna. Hans Hutt was also seized while in Augsburg, where he was put on trial and died on either December 6 or 7 in 1527. What's interesting here is that Hutt and Hubmeier both had not been tried and executed for their Anabaptist work. Hutt was tried for his connections to Munster and his activities in the German Peasants' Revolt, while Hubmeier was tried for sedition and treason in Waldschut. This was because killing Anabaptists was still not yet legal, which would happen in 1529, with the passing of Ferdinand's Diet of the Spire in 1529. However, unofficially, I can guarantee you that Hutt and Hubmeier's Anabaptist activities had everything to do with why Ferdinand wanted them both executed. The Habsburg monarchy's absorption of King Louis II's territories put Ferdinand on the front line against the invading Ottoman Empire. Unfortunately, the Habsburg monarchy was in horrible financial conditions, and out of desperation to defend his territories against the invaders, Ferdinand introduced what he called the Turkish tax, 
which was a war tax to fund his defense. Ferdinand now started putting heavy pressure on the Moravian nobles for war taxes and to contribute lots of fighting-aged boys. But Lord Leonhard of Liechtenstein continued refusing to end his protection that he was granting to the Anabaptists on his estates. In response to Lord Leonhard's refusal, the provost, an imperial police envoy, threatened him with violence. In response, Leonhard of Liechtenstein threatened back, threatening that if any imperial police crossed the boundary line into his territory, they would be met with bullets and cannonballs. The Hutterite Chronicles write that during this heated time, in the villages around Nicholsburg, many left their homes and fled with their wife and children to the mountains. But fortunately, Leonhard's threat worked, and the military police envoy backed off. However, not everyone in Nicholsburg appreciated Lord Leonhard's threats of violence. Around this time, the pacifist Stabler, led by Jacob Wiedemann, had moved outside the walls of Nicholsburg and were living in Bergnen, another village on the Liechtenstein estate. But when one of the prominent swordsmen, Hans Spittelmeier, discovered that the Stabler had separated themselves and were now living in Bergen, the Hutterite Chronicle writes, Spittelmeier, in a public sermon at Nicholsburg, forbade his people, the swordsmen, to have anything to do with Jacob Wiedemann's people, that they should ignore the Stabler because they are forming a separate group. Lord Leonhard then summons Philip Jaeger and Jacob Wiedemann, the leaders of the Stabler, to find out why they were cutting themselves off and creating their own separate church. Lord Leonhard interpreted the Stabler's actions as threatening the uniformity and stability in Nicholsburg. Ultimately, Lord Leonhard asked Wiedemann's group, the Stabler, to leave Nicholsburg once winter was over. And so the Stabler leave in March of 1528. Amazingly, the Hutterite Chronicle captures this historic event of the Stabler leaving Nicholsburg in great detail. The Chronicle writes, So they, the Stabler, offered their goods for sale, some they sold, others they left behind, and they all moved away. Afterward, however, Liechtenstein's people sent on all the goods that they had left behind. About 200 people, not counting the children, from Nicholsburg and Bergen, and the surrounding area gathered outside the town of Nicholsburg. Out of sympathy, a number of people came from the city to see them and wept with them, but others argued with them. Then they got themselves up and went out and pitched camp in a deserted village for one day and one night. They took counsel together in the Lord because of their immediate needs and distress, and appointed deacons for their temporal necessities. Then, while in Bognets, they established the community of goods. James Steyer, a prominent Anabaptist scholar, has dated the establishment of the community of goods as happening on March 22, 1528. And luckily for us, the Hutterite Chronicle describes this historical event as well. These men then spread out a cloak in front of the people, and each one laid his possessions on it with a willing heart, without being forced, so that the needy might be supported in accordance with the teachings of the prophets and apostles. Now apparently, Lord Leonhard may have been hyperventilating a little bit, and having second thoughts about asking the stabler to leave. Leonhard had followed them all the way to Bognitz, pleading that they come back to Nicholsburg. When they refused to return, Liechtenstein continued following them, providing them with drinks and freeing them from the tolls. The chronicle states that Liechtenstein rode with them as far as Utterwitznitz. After crossing the bridge, the brethren set up camp and spent the night. From here, they sent four men ahead to the town of Austerlitz to ask the lords of Connitz if they could become residents with the exemptions from war taxes and from contributing fighting age boys into the military so they could live with a free conscience. The Lords of Connets happily agreed to all of their requests, adding excitedly that even if their number were a thousand, they would yet receive them all. When the Brethren arrived in Austerlitz, the Lords gave them a deserted farmstead to live on and provided them with free wood for them to build houses. The Lords also freed them from rent, taxes, and compulsory labor and other obligations for six years, 
And the Hutterite Chronicle says that their community accepted these incredible acts of kindness as blessings from God. And as their community grew in numbers, they sent out more missionaries all over Europe to spread the word, and the Chronicle emphasizes that they sent missionaries particularly to Tyrol. And who's in Tyrol? Jacob Hutter. Remember back when Hubmeyer had fled Zurich to Nicholsburg and built the Nicholsburg Congregation? Well, George Blaurock, one of the original founders of Anabaptism, had fled Zurich, but fled to Klaassen, Tyrol instead, preaching all throughout the Pusser Valley in Tyrol. The people in Tyrol were very receptive of the Anabaptist message, including much of the Tyrolean ruling class, who were rebaptized and converted to Anabaptism. One of these early converts was a man by the name of Jacob Hutter. Jacob Hutter will soon become a leader of the Hutterites, who will receive their name from Hutter. Later on in 1527, the Habsburg monarch Ferdinand I was now well aware of the large Anabaptist activity in his region, and put forth the Diet Aspire in 1529, an imperial law declaring that the seductive doctrines and heretical sects will not be tolerated. The Diet Aspire in 1529 explicitly ordered for the death penalty of all of those practicing Anabaptism. A terrible persecution of the Anabaptists began all throughout Tyrol, eventually leading to George Blaurock, the leader of the Tyrolean church, being burned alive on September 6, 1529. After the government had killed Blaurock, Jacob Hutter immediately replaced Blaurock as the leader of the Tyrolean Anabaptist church. With the implementation of the death penalty for practicing his faith, Jacob Hutter knew that the writing was on the wall in Tyrol, and that it was only a matter of time until the Anabaptists in Tyrol would all be persecuted to death. So Hutter opened up to the idea of moving to a more tolerant place. Hutter, along with a man named Simon Schutzinger, set off to Moravia in hope of finding lands with greater liberties to relocate the Tyrolean Anabaptists to. Around the same time, Hutter received an invitation from the elders of the Stabler, led by Jacob Weidman, to come visit their church in Austerlitz. Hutter, along with a man named Simon Schutzinger, set off to Austerlitz in hopes of finding lands with greater liberties to relocate the Tyrolean Anabaptists to. Sometime in 1529, Jacob Hutter arrived in Austerlitz and was so impressed by this Austerlitz community, which was led by Jacob Wiedemann, that Hutter actually joined Wiedemann's congregation. Like a true leader, Jacob Hutter returned to Tyrol, the danger zone, where practicing Anabaptism was punishable by death. Hutter immediately began organizing small bands of Tyrolean Anabaptists and sending them off to Austerlitz. Hutter remained as pastor of the Tyrolians for many years, preaching for those who could not yet flee. Along with all the Tyrolean Anabaptists fleeing to Austerlitz, Hutter sent along George Zawring, who would supervise the Tyrolean Anabaptists now in Austerlitz and be responsible for them. Later, in the winter of 1529, it began to become too cold to have religious services outside, so they had to start meeting inside. And because there were so many Tyrolean Anabaptists now living in Austerlitz, there were too many members for them all to meet inside the same shelter, so they had to meet in three separate shelters, with each of the three groups receiving their own leader. Weidman preached to one group, Zawring preached to another group, and a man named William Rublin had his own group. The Hutterite Chronicle states that each leader began to teach different things, Jacob Weidman preached that because Jesus had been a citizen of Capernaum, it was therefore permissible to do civilian duties and swear oaths. But Weidman's teachings were opposed to what many of the Anabaptists believed, causing divisions. There were also other problems that Weidman's group was causing, including their unfair governance and administration of the Austerlitz community. William Rublin began loudly speaking out about the abuses of power that Weidman and his elders were committing, and George Zawring actually sided with William Rublin. Weidman attacked Rublin back and forbade Rublin from being allowed to make his case in front of his group. Rublin then drew up ten charges against Weidman for unfair management of the shared community funds that had resulted in the deaths of twenty children, favoritism of the elders and their wives, and unfairness in discipline, and much, much more. <laughs> 
In one letter written by William Rublin, he argued that Wiedemann's elders and their wives ate and dressed better than the rest of the congregation. Wiedemann refused to allow Rublin to make his case in front of Wiedemann's congregation. Rublin and Zahring were then banned, which resulted in a split between the two groups on January 8, 1531. On January 8, 1531, Rublin, Zahring, and 350 others left Austerlitz and arrived at a town called Ospitz, completely empty-handed, not getting to have back even a portion of what they had contributed to the common fund when they had joined the Austerlitz community. Both the Austerlitz and Ospitz communities wrote letters to Hutter asking for his support in the matter and to try and reunite the two communities. Hutter responded to their letters by visiting Moravia and investigating the division for himself. Hutter concluded that the Austerlitz community, led by Wiedemann, was mostly responsible for the division. Hutter then returned to Tyrol, organizing groups of Tyrolean Anabaptists to Ospitz. However, soon, messengers had to deliver more bad news to Jacob Hutter. It had been discovered that Rublin was not practicing the apostolic community of goods honestly, and had hidden dozens of Gilder coins for himself privately. Hutter and Simon then returned to Ospitz, and Rublin was excluded from the church. Hutter and Simon then left Ospitz and returned to Tyrol, leaving Zahring in charge of the entire church in Ospitz. But the problems in Ospitz continued, and Zahring's wife had committed adultery with another man, who was a brother in the Ospitz church. Thus, Zahring and the whole congregation accordingly excluded the adulterers from the church for a time, and Zahring practiced marital avoidance during her ban. However, he soon took back his wife, something that the Brotherhood could not accept, as it was too light of a punishment for committing adultery. This stirred accusations of unfair treatment, as a more severe punishment would have occurred had it have been someone else. The congregation unanimously agreed to have Zohring and his wife separated from the church. Hutter and Simon came to Ospitz around Easter 1531, and Simon took Zohring's place as leader of the Ospitz group. Hutter and Simon then united the Ospitz congregation with the Philippolites, another Anabaptist group, which had been led by Philip Baramel, who were also located in Ospitz. They also united the group with the Gabrielites, who were located in Rossitz, 25 miles away, led by a man named Gabriel Asherham. And Jacob Hutter once again returned to the danger zone in Tyrol, organizing small groups of Anabaptists and sending them to Ospitz. But on August 11, 1533, Jacob Hutter finally arrived in Ospitz with the intent to stay permanently and to help Simon in the leadership of the group. However, Simon felt threatened by Hutter and wanted to have all the power to himself, while Jacob Hutter simply wanted to have equal leadership over the group. This resulted in a power struggle. But shortly thereafter, it was discovered that Simon had kept dozens of coins hidden in his private room, never having contributed them to the shared community of goods. After admitting what he had done in front of the entire congregation, he was excommunicated by the Ospitz congregation, and by the will of the people, Simon was replaced as leader by none else than Jacob Hutter. However, Philip and Gabriel rejected Hutter's leadership and continued to stand by Simon. Hutter made appeals to both Philip and Gabriel with the hopes that these three groups would stay united. However, this was impossible, and the division between Hutter's congregation and the Philippites and Gabrielites was finalized on November 22, 1533. While this division may at first come across as a bad thing, it actually leads to the end of the factionalization and diversity of beliefs and opinions. Under Hutter's leadership, over the next two years, the Ospitz congregation undergoes what's called the refinement process, whereby all the peripheral adherents with one foot in and one foot out leave because of their softness, lack of true belief, and their lack of discipline. <laughs>
This allows for the narrowing and simplification of the doctrine, lowering the number of total adherents but retaining the truest believers with the highest conviction and the greatest vitality. Over the next two years, Jacob Hutter's tough and disciplined leadership allowed for the creation of the economically durable and socially cohesive community organization. Hutter also eliminated the last remnants of materialist temptations and fleshy desires. This new organization and focus gave the Hutterites the capacity to send out their members on the largest mission trips yet, missionizing all throughout Europe, where famously only 20% of the Hutterite missionaries would return home. But this high missionary mortality rate was worth it, as Hutter preached to his Auspitz congregation that they were indeed God's elect, who were despised by the worldly, modern people, and should only expect hardship and suffering. And now, after Jacob Hutter's leadership, it's pretty safe to start calling this group of Christians the Hutterites. In 1535, severe persecution was reignited by Ferdinand I after the Munster Rebellion had taken place. This group of radical and violent Christians claimed to be Anabaptists, but in reality, this claim could not be further from the truth. The Munsterites had nothing in common with the mainstream Anabaptists, nor the Anabaptist principles. The Munsterites used violence to achieve their goals, and combined the church and the state. But nevertheless, either out of sheer convenience or complete ignorance, the Anabaptists and the Munsterites became synonymous with each other, leading to horrific persecution of the true Anabaptists. In 1535, Ferdinand demanded that the Moravian nobles expel all of their Anabaptist tenants, even going to Moravia himself to repeat this demand. Thus, all the different Anabaptist groups in Moravia were expelled from their villages and left to fend for themselves, no longer under the protection of the powerful local nobles of the estates. During this persecution, the Austerlitz group was almost completely destroyed by the persecution, and Jacob Weidmann died in Vienna. The Martyr's Mirror records the names of over 2,000 people who were killed in these persecutions. The Gabrielites moved to Silesia, but many became unhappy with their leader, and many joined the Hutterites in the years before Gabriel's death in 1545. After Gabriel Astraham's death, the Gabrielites completely disintegrated, and most of the Gabrielites joined the Hutterite community on January 16, 1545. A smaller Bruderhof of the Philippites that lived in Polgram, Moravia, united with the Hutterites in 1535, but most of the Philippites scattered and fled to Germany or Upper Austria, but who, in a few years, will be visited by Peter Riedman, who will ultimately convert them into Hutterites. Unlike the other groups, most of the Hutterites did not flee Moravia, but instead scattered, and went into hiding in the Moravian fields and forests, in small bands of five to eight people, carrying all their belongings on their backs. Jacob Hutter wrote a daring letter to their persecutors, and ended up being captured on November 29, 1535. Hutter was whipped, tortured on the rack, but refused to recant, and also refused to give up the hiding places of his fellow Hutterites and was executed on the stake on February 25th, 1536. It's important to note here that there was no fragmentation of the Hutterites after the execution of Jacob Hutter, because Hutter successfully integrated the diverse groups into one united economic and social organization, with each settlement or colony being called a Bruderhof. After his death, Hutter was replaced by his close associate Hans Amann, who successfully led the scattered, small bands of Hutterites during these dangerous times. Under Hans' leadership, the Hutterites unleashed the full potential of their missionary ability, sending out passionate missionaries who spread their message all throughout Central Europe. As mentioned, four-fifths of the missionaries who were sent out were martyred, but the converts all came to the lands of Moravia.
During this time, a man named Peter Reedman joined the Hutterites in 1532 and became a very successful Hutterite missionary. Soon, Reedman also emerged as the intellectual leader of the Hutterites in the 1530s, and in 1540 and 1541, he wrote the Reichenschaft, which the Hutterites accepted as their complete and official statement of their faith. All of Reedman's hard work is why he's often referred to as the second founder of the Hutterian Brotherhood. Persecution became severe again between the years 1547 and 1553, during the aggression surrounding the Schmalkaldic League War. The Hutterite Chronicles named this time period the Second Great Persecution. In 1555, the Peace of Augsburg was signed, ending the aggression between the Catholic Charles V and the Protestant Schmalkaldic League. This ushered in a period of relative safety for the Hutterites, who returned to their Moravian homes. The Hutterites described the time period between 1554 and 1565 as good, and the time period between 1665 and 1592 as golden. This period in time is usually referred to as the Golden Age of the Hutterites. During this period, the Hutterites in each Bruderhof would sleep in large rooms where they were separated along the lines of married couples, single brothers, and single sisters. Under the leadership of Peter Walpott, the creation of advanced schools for the Hutterite children were developed. These Hutterite schools were run so well that even the non-Hutterites would send their children to them. The Hutterites were predominantly craftsmen at this time, producing knives, pottery, carpentry, millers, and barbers. Powerful nobles would buy Hutterite products, particularly their knives and pottery, which became famous. But the Hutterite doctors were also very famous, serving in the nobles' households. Hutterite doctors also served the Emperor Rudolf II. During these golden years in Moravia, which lasted until 1592, the Hutterites expanded into Upper Hungary, modern-day Slovakia, establishing over 85 Bruderhofs in total and growing to a population size of somewhere between 20,000 and 30,000 Hutterites. But the Hutterian Golden Age soon came to a sudden halt. With the breakout of the Long Turkish War, Emperor Rudolf II forced the nobles for war taxes and fighting-aged men, things that the Hutterites had refused to do. Thus, every year, the Hutterites had their possessions, such as their cattle, stolen as a means of collecting these war taxes. During this war, soldiers from both sides would encamp on Hutterite colonies, raiding the Hutterite brethren's food supplies and committing horrific assaults on the Hutterite men, women, and children. At least 11 colonies were completely destroyed, with countless numbers being killed. One particularly horrific event happened in June of 1605, when the Turks came upon the Hutterites, murdered the men, and kidnapped all the women and many children. A total of 240 Hutterites, mostly girls and women, were abducted by the Ottomans and taken back to the Ottoman Empire where they were sold into the Ottoman slavery. If you're interested, I already made an entire video about this event, including about the Hutterite who made it his personal mission to rescue the captured Hutterite sisters. It's an incredible story of a Hutterite's journey through the foreign Ottoman Empire into Constantinople, searching for the enslaved Hutterites while experiencing great hardship. So make sure you check that video out. But there was another problem that was facing the Hutterites, and that was the growing Counter-Reformation, which was the Catholic reaction against the rising Protestantism, where the Roman Catholic Church was attempting to regain its power and adherence that it had lost to Protestantism. And the Catholic Church was trying to regain their power in a number of ways, including the creation of the Society of Jesus, or also called the Jesuits. The Jesuits infiltrated governments, educational systems, and the groups of their enemies, with many Jesuits being dedicated to eradicating the Hutterite heresy. While the Long Turkish War ended in 1606, the Thirty Years' War broke out just a few years later, in 1618, before the Hutterites could even rebuild their communities and their resource stockpiles. Ferdinand II invaded the majority Protestant Bohemia and Moravia, plundering many Hutterite settlements, 
During these years, the Hutterites hid under the ground in subterranean caves and passages that are thought to have been made in the 13th century. After Ferdinand II had taken over the Czech lands in 1620, horrific persecution followed. Twelve Hutterite colonies were burned to the ground, with hundreds being killed, assaulted, and tortured indiscriminately. These truly horrific, unspeakable crimes caused many of the Moravian Hutterites to leave the Czech lands, where they fled to the Hutterite settlements in Upper Hungary, modern-day Slovakia, and made home in a Hutterite Bruderhof in Sobotist. John Hostetler writes that 3,000 fleeing Hutterites lived in this Bruderhof for the next couple of years. After conquering Moravia, Ferdinand appointed a man named Cardinal Dystristein to be governor of Moravia. Dystristein was a sworn enemy of the Hutterian brethren and will soon seek to destroy them. And if things couldn't get any worse for the Hutterites, in 1621, the bubonic plague swept through the Hutterite colonies, killing a third of all Hutterites. In the summer of 1622, Cardinal Dystristein, the governor of Moravia, expelled all the remaining Hutterites from Moravia. The authorities sealed the Hutterites' buildings and homes shut. The officials told the homeless Hutterites that they could only return to their homes and enjoy safety if they converted to Catholicism. John Hostetler writes that 230 Hutterites accepted this offer. On September 28, 1622, the homeless Hutterites who refused the offer were given four weeks to leave Moravia and were not allowed to stay even for the coming winter. The Hutterites left Moravia with absolutely nothing, with the Hutterite Chronicle writing that they left behind 24,000 bushels of wheat, 70 oxen, 655 hogs, and 150 horses, among tons of other property. These homeless Hutterites made their way to Upper Hungary, modern-day Slovakia, and met up with the Hutterites at Sobotist, where they were welcomed by the lords who similarly despised Ferdinand II. But the large influx of Hutterites immediately created shortages in food, clothing, and bedding. A severe famine also came, skyrocketing the prices of food. The Hutterite Chronicle writes about this period as follows. The Lord had sent this distress to his people as a test and purification to reveal the proven ones. Many could not stand the test, particularly the superficial and insincere, even though they had left Moravia. They were just like the children of Israel who left Egypt, but as soon as they came were faced with suffering, disaster, hunger, and cold, and thought about Egypt where they had plenty of bread, and turned back, abandoning the Lord and his church. This excerpt explains to us that many of the Hutterites who fled Moravia to Upper Hungary later turned back when the going got tough and returned to their homes in Moravia, ultimately converting to Catholicism. Now, during this Hutterite expulsion from Moravia in 1621, the Prince of Transylvania, Gabriel Bethlen, and his wife, Suanna, both Calvinists, were in dire need of skilled craftsmen, carpenters, masons, potters, and farmers to work their Transylvanian estates. And so Bethlen sent an unusually large delegation to the Hutterites to deliver his invitation to come and work in his domain. John Hostetler writes that this delegation came to the Hutterites in Neumenthal, Kastus, and Wadowitz. At these colonies, the large delegation delivered an eight-point letter of proposition to the Hutterites. In the letter, the prince promised the Hutterites everything necessary to start a colony, including freedom of religion, the development of trades, and protection. John Hostetler writes that the Hutterites originally thought that it was a trap, and the Hutterites seemed to have a very good street smarts because their instincts were absolutely spot on. Before they could come to a decision, the prince's messengers ended up forcibly seizing a group of 85 Hutterites. Eight days later, the prince's messengers forcibly seized another 101 Hutterites with the intent on taking all of them to Alwyns in Transylvania. On April 2nd, 1621, the 186 captured Hutterites, accompanied by 70 guards and with 18 wagons, began their journey to Alwyns, Transylvania, 580 kilometers away. <laughs> 
Upon their arrival in Alwyn's, the Hutterites were given their own living quarters, and they were actually treated relatively well in Transylvania. Over the next two years, hundreds of more Hutterites fled to Alwyn's Transylvania, bringing their entire Transylvanian Hutterite population to between 1 and 2,000. And thus, there becomes two centers of the Hutterian Brethren. The first center is in Upper Hungary, and the second is in Transylvania. Unfortunately, we will now only be focusing on the journey of the Transylvanian Hutterites for the rest of this video, as the Hutterites in Upper Hungary do end up losing their religious fervor over time, and assimilate into the general surrounding population. According to John Hostetler, by 1686, there were no longer any Hutterite Bruderhofs in Upper Hungary, as they had given up their community of goods. These Hutterites did continue to maintain a separate identity from the broader society, which were called the Habaner. But this identity ended in the 1800s, when the remaining holdouts finally converted to Catholicism, and their unique, separate identity became extinct. So we're going to focus all of our attention now on the Hutterites in Transylvania, because this is the population of Hutterites that all modern Hutterites are descendants of. The original Alwyn's Castle can still be seen today. It was here, inside the Transylvanian princess's stable, where the Hutterites temporarily stayed after arriving in the winter of 1622. The Hutterites also used to meet in this cathedral, which had been built by Germans from Saxony in the 1200s. During the Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648, while the Hutterite Bruderhofs in Upper Hungary suffered great losses, the Transylvanian Bruderhofs in Alwyns prospered. However, another war soon broke out between the invading Ottoman Empire and Transylvania, creating disaster for the Transylvanian Hutterites. John Hostetler writes that from 1658 to 1661, the Hutterites at Alwyns took refuge in the high ridges about five miles from their Bruderhof in Alwyns. They built hideouts with rocks, with some Hutterites living in these hideouts for two years. Their Alwyns Bruderhof itself was plundered and burned down by the Turkish raiders in 1661, a disaster from which the Transylvanian Hutterites never recovered. The Hutterite Chronicle records these atrocities in great detail. It recounts numerous occasions where hordes of Ottomans would come to the Hutterite Bruderhofs, commit horrible atrocities on the men, women, and children, and abduct hundreds of them for slavery back in Turkey, and from there sold all throughout the Ottoman Empire all the way to Iraq, where the Ottoman Empire extended to. In the second half of the 1600s, after suffering from these huge losses from the Ottoman invasions, the Hutterites were joined by some anti-Trinitarians. These anti-Trinitarians rejected the Trinity and believed that Jesus Christ was merely a human, and therefore subordinate to God. As you can imagine, this caused lots of internal strife in the Hutterian brethren, who had always accepted the doctrine of the Trinity, placing great emphasis on the teachings of Jesus Christ. George Geisy was one of these Hutterite elders who was an anti-Trinitarian, but when he decided to leave the Hutterian congregation, he took with him a huge sum of the Hutterites' communal property. Dr. Astrid von Schlatzta says that Geisy stole six or seven carts away from the Hutterites' best common property. This financially devastated the Hutterite Bruderhof in Alwyns, causing even more hardship. Remember, this is after the Bruderhof and Alwyns had been completely burned down by the Turks. And then, sometime in the 1690s, the Transylvanian congregation in Alwyns completely abandoned the community of goods altogether. Dr. Astrid von Schlatzta says that by 1738, the Hutterite community in Alwyns consisted of only 36 souls. So things are not looking well for the future of the Hutterites. So what happens to all the Hutterites now? Is this the end, my friend? Do the Hutterian Brotherhood really allow this persecution to finish them off after a good 200 year run? Well, to find out what happens to the Hutterites next, you're going to have to wait for the final part of this two-part series. But let me tell you, it will be totally worth your wait and I'll put it right here once it's been released.
In the meantime, check out my other videos that I've done about the Hutterites, Amish, and the Anabaptists in general. Also, make sure you've subscribed to my channel and click the notification bell so that you get a notification when that part two has been released. Thank you so much for watching this documentary. If you enjoy my work, please consider supporting my work on Patreon. By becoming a Patreon, I will respond to all of your questions through Patreon's direct messages. You will also get early access to all of my documentaries before they're released to the general public. But most importantly, you will be helping me produce higher quality and more frequent content in the future. I appreciate you for watching until the very end. Take care of yourself and always remember, you are beautiful and unique. Have a great rest of your day.